All right, well today we are back to work on the C6 Corvette competition drift build. Now, if you've followed along with this build, you might be wondering what we could possibly be doing. The car is done, it's essentially it's been done. We built this thing up from a bare, bare carcass in about six months. We got it done mechanically, we got it running, we got it driving. We took it to the dyno. We took it testing. We took it testing again with body panels. And then we finally took it to its first round of competition. where it made it to the top eight and did exceedingly well. It performed above all expectations. And we were all geared up to go to our fifth round, fifth and final round of the season, when it unfortunately got canceled. So instead, we took the car to a fun event, thrashed on it all weekend, beating the snot out of it, bouncing off limiter, shooting flames out the hood. And through all of that, the car has held up incredibly well. We've had virtually no issues. It has gone about as good as any uh, car builder could hope for with a build this involved. So what's there to do? If the car's done, if it's working, what's left? Well, if you know race cars, you know that they're never done. There's always more performance to be had and ways to improve it. And we intentionally left some performance on the table when we built this car, and we're finally coming to collect on that performance and make this thing even faster. So you might be thinking that means we're going to be adding power, but we are not actually. We haven't even scratched the surface on the power that this car has available. It made 1100 horsepower on the dyno at 15 pounds of boost. The most it has ever seen drifting is nine pounds of boost. And that was an extreme circumstance that the car hooked up at competition on a grippy track surface. The most it's ever seen on a track like the OSW skid pad is five to six pounds of boost. That's about where it runs on average, which is probably 650 horsepower or so. So we are not in need of any more power. We actually still have a lot of headroom left in the power department. We just don't have any use for it because we don't have the grip. It's a very common misconception in drifting that power equals speed. The more power a car has, the faster it's gonna be. You put a 500 horsepower car up against a 1,000 horsepower car, the 1,000 horsepower car will be faster, but that is not the case. The power is only useful if you have the grip to back it up. If you don't have the grip, there's no use for the power. All you're doing is spinning the tires to rev limiter faster. You're not actually going anywhere. So that's where we're going to be improving on this thing. That's where we're gonna be making it faster. And we did, again, intentionally leave room on the table in the grip department because we wanted to get the car done, get our feet wet, get some seat time in it, test it out and make sure that it just held up as it was with the grip level we had in it and then see about going to the next level. And now it's time, again, to collect on that and take this thing to the next level of grip and speed. All right, guys, before we get too deep into today's video, I wanted to talk to you about today's video sponsor, Factor. So Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, gourmet, chef-inspired, really delicious meals right to your door that are ready to eat in under two minutes. I mean, it is one of the best things I've ever come across because I like eating healthy. I always want to eat healthy, and I try to eat healthy on a regular basis, but it normally comes at the sacrifice of my time. It normally means getting out of the shop an hour earlier, two hours earlier, three hours earlier if I gotta go to the grocery store. And when it boils down to it, when that time comes, I'm usually just not willing to call it early. There's just too much to do, and I can't ever 
bring myself to sacrifice my time to eat healthy. But Factor allows me to do both. I get to eat healthy, quality, delicious meals. They have so many options, but without the sacrifice of my time, literally two minutes. Like I said, it has really been a game changer because the easier something is to do, the more likely you are to stick to it. And it has helped me stick to eating healthy on a regular basis. And one of the coolest things too, is that it's so flexible, right? So I can add a smoothie for the mornings if I wanna have a smoothie in the morning before I go to work, or I can also dial it back. You know, there's times where I'm gonna be out of town for a week. I don't want the meals just sitting there and going to waste. I can dial back my box for that week and I'm good to go. And that's really helpful for me because I'm always traveling and busy and being able to prepare like that is really helpful. And I get just what I need, not too much, not too little. And I have saved so much money from takeout because that's what my options end up being without time is takeout or frozen food, neither of which are great options. So another meal service that we really like, Chrissy and I, is HelloFresh. It has also been great in helping us stick to our goals. And fortunately, Factor is actually owned by HelloFresh. So I can get you a discount code regardless of which one kind of suits your lifestyle. That being said, if you are interested in that discount code, head to go.factor75.com slash taylordrifts60 and use code TaylorJS60 to get 60% off your first box. That's go.factor75.com slash TaylorJS60 and use the code TaylorJS60 to get 60% off your first box. It's a really good deal and a really good way to try it out and see if it's for you. If you're like me, you're gonna fall in love with it and be like, how did I live my whole life without this? Because it's pretty sweet. Uh, but that being said, we talk about a minimal on time. We don't have a lot of time and we do have a lot to do to this car. So we need to get back to it. So when we built this car, we knew pretty early on that we were going to be using these tires. This is a 315-4018 Nitto NT555 G2. This is a phenomenal drift tire. It is obviously massive and it's super wide, but it also is super tall with really tall sidewalls. So that makes it a really good tire for both side grip and forward grip. It's got a good in-between compound where it's grippy enough, but it also lasts forever. You can run super low pressures. It's all around a killer tire. And knowing that we were gonna run this tire, we knew that we didn't really need to kind of cheat the grip with the chassis. So what I mean by that is you make grip two ways. You can make grip from the tire or you can make grip from the chassis, the suspension setup. Now, obviously you're normally doing both, but let's say you went from a small tire to a larger tire with a softer compound, you're gonna gain grip that way without doing anything to the car. But if you're running the same tire and you want more grip, you can modify the chassis, change the suspension, the spring rates, the way it gains toe, the static toe, you can change all of these things to allow the car itself to make more mechanical grip, more chassis grip. Now we haven't delved into that at all with this car because we knew again that the tire was more than capable of making the grip level we needed. But we have found ourselves now that we've kind of gotten through the initial testing phases of the car using all of the tire grip that we can get. We still got a little room on the table, like two pounds of pressure, um, but we have maxed out the tire when we're driving on low grip surfaces like the skid pad. So, now it's time to finally unlock some more of the potential of the chassis itself so that we can make a little more grip and have a little more grip available if we need it, if we're running on a loose track surface. So let me whip this thing up, get it torn apart, and then I'll show you what we're gonna be doing to make it make that extra grip that we need. So this is what we have on the car currently. We've got a stock lower control arm, a stock knuckle, and an adjustable upper control arm just to be able to adjust the rear camber of the car. But other than that, it's all stock, stock bushing, stock everything. And this is what we have to go on the car. So this is a rear grip kit from Just Engineering. So this is the same company who we got our front angle kit from. So I was really impressed with their kit and the car drives amazing with it. So 
I decided to go ahead and get the rear grip kit as well. So I've actually had it for a while. We're just kind of finally getting around to installing it. So this is going to replace everything. Our upper control arm, our lower control arm, and our knuckle will all now be aftermarket with a lot more adjustability. One in the normal areas of camber and things like that, but we can also adjust our toe gain to change the way the suspension acts dynamically as it compresses. Now that's really the biggest thing, but another big benefit is we're going to be replacing all of these soft gooey rubber bushings with all solid spherical joints, which means we won't have any deflection. When you have rubber bushings like this, they're compliant, they can move around. And as you load them up, they will move. So your alignment's kind of ever changing. And that problem just amplifies as you add more power and more grip to the car. Whereas these, we won't have any give whatsoever. Our alignment will stay fixed. Now this also has a dual caliper mount. So it has a radial mount for a secondary caliper, which is huge because it is very difficult to put a second caliper on the stock knuckle. There's just not a lot of room for it. So with this, your dual caliper bracket is built in. Now we aren't running dual caliper because we have a pedal box and we don't really need it. But if you wanted to run dual caliper, your mount's built in, which is really nifty. So yeah, that's what we got to go on the car. Start installing it, see how it all fits. If there's one thing I've learned from doing projects like this, if you have two sides to deal with, always complete one side, take it apart, put it together with the new stuff before tearing apart the other side. That way, if it doesn't fit, you only have one side to put back together, not two. So I wanted to do that with this and even go a little further and not strip apart my old suspension because we don't have a stock Corvette driveline in here and I wanna make sure this is all gonna work with our axles and diff setup. Before I go stripping apart the stock suspension, just so that way I've got less work to put it all back together if I need to. But fortunately, it all fits, it all works. The axle's right in its window, we're good to go. So we can start stripping apart the stock suspension get the wheel bearing off. That's about the only thing we're gonna save from the stock suspension is the wheel bearing hub assembly. Everything else is getting replaced. So we swap that into our new knuckle. We've already got the arms on, so now it's a pretty easy process to bolt this back together with the knuckle. So I went ahead and took the shock out because this setup is going to allow us to change our alignment dynamically. As it compresses and decompresses, the alignment's going to change and there's gonna be a different rate of change. So I wanna be able to cycle it through its travel without the shock there so I can see what each setting does and how aggressive each setting is so we know kind of where to start and roughly what each setting is going to do in terms of how aggressive it's going to change camber and toe throughout the suspension sweep. So this is also a really good way to verify that you don't have anything binding up in your suspension. If the shock's there, you can't really cycle it up and down all the way. But with the shock out, you can go from full max droop all the way up to fully compressed, you know, past really the range that it's ever gonna go and make sure that it cycles through smoothly and it doesn't bind up anywhere, you don't bump into anything and that everything's good to go. So we verified that, we've eyeballed what the toe change is gonna be. It's really difficult to tell without the wheel on here because you don't have a great reference point to look at to see what the change is and how drastic it is, but we've got a good idea. We've got a roughly a good baseline and now we know everything looks like it's gonna work. Everything seems happy. The axles aren't binding up. They aren't bottoming out. We've got everything in the right window where everything is playing nicely. <laughs> everything is working together with all of the different systems, which is important and can be difficult. So now all we've gotta do is just cinch it all down. We've done our homework, we've done the legwork to make sure it's gonna work before we put in the physical work of tightening everything down and setting everything up. So I try to get the suspension alignment close before we put the wheel on just cause it's going to be easier to do now than later. And then all we've gotta do is put the brakes back on and the suspension on this side at least is complete. All right, well, this side is complete. Looks pretty snazzy in there, matches the cage nicely. Same as the front suspension, but I wanna go ahead and get the wheel on and then see how it all aligns out first before we start doing the other side. That way we can match it and be pretty close. But man, what a snazzy setup compared to the non-grip kit side. It looks absolutely killer in there. And then on top of that, now it's a proper race car. We have all solid spherical bearings throughout the entire suspension of the car. Even the shock mount is a spherical bearing instead of a bushing. I don't have any rubber bushings in this thing except for the sway bars. So let's put the wheel on and uh, see what it looks like. All right, 
as expected, we are towed way in. So it's really hard to tell eyeballing just the suspension with no wheel on it. Which is good because we've got a ton of room to pull the toe out. All right, sweet. Let's set it down, see what it looks like. Jeez, that's a lot of toe <laughs> Wow, we might have to uh, pull a little bit of that out. All right, well, we've got it about right now. We still need to pull a little bit of toe out. Maybe some camber. It's tough to tell. We really need to get the camber gauge on there. But you can see. So watch this and you'll see it gain the toe as it compresses. I don't know if you can see that, but basically as the suspension travels upwards, the wheel toes in, which is going to effectively add more grip. More toe generally adds more grip. Now you wanna be careful with it because it also does make the car a little bit different to drive. If you can avoid getting grip out of toe, you're better off, but I wanna try it and have the option and we'll see how we like it. In worst case, if we do need that extra touch of grip, we can add some toe gain or just add some static toe. But yeah, moral of the story is, everything seems like it's gonna align out fine. We still got axial play in the shaft. It's not fully extended out and it's not compressed all the way in. So just little things you gotta look at when you're modifying cars and you're using parts that aren't necessarily designed to work with each other. You know, this rear grip kit isn't designed around using a front trans winner's quick change with drive shaft shop axles. So you gotta make sure everything's gonna be happy. So now we need to just toss this side on. It should go a whole lot quicker and then we'll probably spend a bunch of time tinkering with the alignment and the toe gain and all that stuff. But before we start working on that, we got a project that's gonna take some time to cure. So let's get that knocked out real quick. That way, by the time it's done, we're done and we can put it on. So the project that I'm referring to is a front sway bar. So we haven't had a front sway bar hooked up on this car the whole time. The one that's on there was a home built deal and it basically makes contact with the subframe. So we just bind the suspension up. So we never hooked it up from the start and because we never had the front bar, we never hooked up the rear bar because in drifting, generally you want way more front bar than rear bar. A lot of times you want a front sway bar and no rear bar at all. So having a big rear sway bar and no front bar would be kind of the opposite of what we would most likely want. So basically we've had no sway bars this whole time. So I bought this one. I was gonna make my own blade style bar like this, but I already made one. And sometimes it's easier to just buy the parts than to spend a bunch of time making your own. And this one I think should clear everything that we've got going on. We've got a lot of stuff in the sway bar area. I'll show you when we go to put this on, but uh, I wanna go ahead and get it painted so it's drying while we're working on the rear suspension. I really hope I saved myself some cardboard when I purged the shop. All right, while we're waiting on that, let's knock out this other side.
All right, sign two is officially complete. Take a look at underneath with both of them on there. Definitely, definitely a nice looking combo. Obviously it's not about looks, but it's nice to see uh, nice suspension arms under here. I wish I would have weighed the setups. I kind of thought about it after I was most of the way done with this one, but I would guarantee you we saved a good bit of weight switching from the old stuff to this stuff. This stuff's pretty lightweight. And one of the other big things with going to all spherical bushings is not only will we not have that bushing deflection, but we won't have bushing bind either. So with the stock control arm, if you saw when I unbolted it, I had to get the bolts fully loose before it would swing down at all, even with nothing else here to hold it up. And that's because the bushings bind up. That's why you're supposed to tighten down your suspension at ride height. Whereas the spherical bearings and spherical joints don't do that. So there won't be any resistance in the suspension travel other than the shock and spring, which is what you want. So that being said, before we put these wheels back on, we gotta change tires. We are not running these tires at the competition. So the final competition of the year that we are going to is the LZ Invitational. It's Adam LZ's kind of open house meet and greet uh, event, but with a really cool competition. Ton of people we compete with all the time and, and other series and tons of friends, drift friends from around the country, all competing in our backyard at OSW. And there's some really cool prizes this time. There's a 2J, an SR, and an RB. Uh, so it's a really cool prize pack. Uh, I'm just excited to drive with the friends. But one thing about this event is we all have to run the same tire. It's a spec tire. Uh, and that tire is the same tire that we already run, but a little different. Let me show you. So this is the tire we normally run, the 315-4018 NT555G2. This is the tire we're going to be running. It is also an NT Triple Five G2. It's just a 265-35. So as you can see, it's obviously a much, much narrower tire than what we usually run, but it's also much shorter. It's about two inches shorter overall than the 315, which means it also has a much, much smaller sidewall. So it kind of creates a bit of a domino effect with car setup because the smaller sidewall wins itself to have less side bite and the smaller contact patch means it's just gonna have less grip overall even though it's effectively the same tire. There's obviously going to be less grip uh, same for same if you just swap that tire to that tire because there's a much smaller contact patch. But more than that is the height. So changing the height of the tire means at the same ride height suspension setting that we have now for the big tire, the car is gonna be significantly lower to the ground. So we need to set the ride height for the smaller tire first before we can align it because changing ride height will change the alignment. So the domino effect, it also drastically changes our gearing. So the larger tire, the same revolutions will be a higher mile per hour. So you can see here's our list of gears and wheel speeds. So you can see 55, 72, 96, 115. That's the mile an hour in each gear. Now, if you go over here, this is with the 265. We go down to 51, 67, 89, and 107. So we dropped seven and a half miles an hour in fourth gear just by changing tire size. So we're gonna have to take that into consideration and probably change the gearing up just a little bit. I'm still not sure what I wanna go with speed wise. Uh, so we'll do that last. I gotta take some time to think on it. But the point is we've gotta make some changes along the way, which is why I decided to just go ahead and knock these upgrades out since we'd be in there tinkering with it anyway. I wasn't gonna wait till the off season to do all this stuff, so I had time to test it, but the car's gonna drive so much different on the different tire. If the setup makes it drive different too, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna be kind of learning it again anyway. So that being said, <laughs> I need to quit jibber jabbering and I need to get these tires mounted so we can get them on the cars, we can set ride height and do all that stuff. It can be a tedious process, but it's important to do it right. Wheels are on, I haven't touched the ride height. I'm going to go ahead and set it on the ground and see where we're at. I did run this size tire one time at the last event I drove. Granted, they were on my front wheels, but when I came back in and the suspension had settled, I couldn't get the jack under the subframe, so it was pretty low. So before we start messing with the ride height, we do need to get a baseline with these tires. We know the car is gonna be physically too low. Wheel to fender, it's about right. We actually still have a little bit of wheel gap because these wheels are so much more sunk with these tires on them. 
but we're not really worried about that. We're worried about the actual ride height of the car. With these wheels being so much smaller and overall height diameter, if we don't adjust the ride height, the subframe will end up about two inches off the ground. So we might bottom it out just dropping a tire off track or going over a bump, things like that. So we need to raise it up for the actual ride height of the car and the chassis more so than the wheel and tire thinning. We don't have to worry about rubbing or getting into the fenders with these tires. We just need to get the ride height correct to where the rake and everything is about the same as it was before. So after some tinkering, we, we've got it pretty close. Now we just need to work on the alignment side of things, which you can spend a lot of time on this, but we're just gonna get it roughly where we want it because we'll probably mess with it at the track anyway. So there's no point in going too crazy with it right now. So with that done, it's time to move on to the front sway bar. So you can see the sway bar that came with this car was a home built unit and it just basically runs right into the subframe. The sway bar ends are just too close to the subframe and they really don't need to be for you to have good wheel clearance. So we're gonna ditch this thing and hopefully this new sway bar will fit with our angle kit since they're definitely not designed together and give us the clearance that we need. So this one actually also comes with new Delrin bushing so it's gonna tighten everything up there and just having a sway bar on this car should be a drastic improvement as a whole, regardless of what sway bar it is. So I do have to modify the lower control arm a little bit. The mounting holes just not meant for this big of a bolt that these sway bar and links have. But fortunately, the Dremel with a nice carbide burr on the end makes short work of opening up the hole in all the right directions and not the wrong directions. And we're able to get the big giant half inch bolt through and get this thing in position, adjusted and tightened down and bolted up. And with that, the sway bar is officially installed. It fits about as good as I could have hoped for a combination that's not meant to work together and we still have plenty of tire clearance. We don't have to worry about the sway bar ever being the limiting factor on how much angle we can run on this thing because even with as much angle as it has right now, we still have it pretty limited. So with that done, the rear suspension roughed out and basically aligned, it's time to move on to changing the rear gear. As I mentioned, our gearing's not gonna be quite right with the smaller tires, so we've come up with a gear that we wanna use to get kind of what we assume is the right mile an hour. I'm still torn on this, but fortunately, that's the beauty of having a quick change diff. If we wanna change it at the track, we can. So we get the gear swapped over, get the diff cover bolted back on, and the car is good to go. All right, we got this thing back on the ground. Soy bar is on, it clears everything, and links are hooked up. I am really excited to see what this car drives like with the front sway bar. I consider going up a bit in front rate. I still might, but I wanna see how it feels now with the sway bar, since that's gonna be a pretty drastic change. The car already drove really well without one, even though I've always had big front bars. So I'm curious to see what it's like now, but I like to make one big change at a time. So that way I kind of know what did what, and you build that mental database that way. If you make a bunch of changes, you don't know which one <laughs> had the positive impact. Uh, the rear kind of the same situation. I did debate changing the rear spring rate because I've thought about going softer for a while, um, but also going to this smaller tire, we would really naturally want to go softer. Basically, the less grip you have, the less load you're putting into the suspension, the less spring rate you need. This tire is not gripping as much, it's not going to try to weight transfer as much, and it's not going to compress the spring as much. But the new suspension kit from Just Engineering should essentially soften things up on its own because now we won't be fighting that bushing bind that we had with the factory control arm. So I want to see how it is with this first and then we'll debate on changing spring rate down the road. One big thing at a time, <laughs> at least per end. We did two big things, but they're different ends of the car. They affect different uh, sections of the way it drives. So that being said, I've checked the fluids. We got the gear changed, top that fluid off, top the coolant off. I normally like to do an oil change between every event, but the car's not gonna see as much abuse since we're on so much smaller of a tire. There's not gonna be anywhere near as much load throughout the whole system, the entire drivetrain. So I think we can go one more event and then do a fluids refresh for the off season. So there's really not much left to it, but to uh, throw it in the trailer and take it to the track and have some fun. I'm most excited, A, to get some seat time in this thing. Uh, seat time in a car is so important. I always felt so comfortable in the Miata because I drove it all the time. And I'm trying to do the same with this. I'm trying to drive it as much as possible. Um, and B, just driving with friends from all over the country in a really chill, laid back environment. It's still a comp 
but I don't think most of us are going into it with the same comp mindset that we would at a normal comp. I think we're all just going to have fun. It's just a good excuse for a bunch of friends from all over the country to come together and drive together. So that's what I'm most excited about. Let me know what you guys think of the vet build and the upgrades. How do you think it's going to fare at the competition? We're definitely at the, on the heavier end with a spec tire like this particular tire. It would be ideal to be really lightweight, have a lightweight setup, but I think we can tweak and tinker and get this thing to be at least as quick as everybody else. That's the goal at least. That being said, I'm Jibber Jabber and I'm going to go ahead and end it here, but I do want to say two things, three things. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and that I hope to see you next time. All right, goodbye. I miss.